Hello and welcome back to the Global Health Pursuit podcast. This is part two of our series highlighting epilepsy and mental health awareness initiatives in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Today we'll be diving into more of Tigo's mission, including his origins in Africa, his experience with the Harvard Innovation Lab, and his goals of destigmatizing epilepsy and increasing medical resources in underserved areas. He also lays out his very innovative approach of using a fair profit company to sustainably provide essential care to epilepsy patients all around the world. And make sure to listen till the end to learn about how you can get involved in raising awareness and funds for epilepsy just through a simple cup of coffee. Thanks for being here. My name is Hethel Bauman, and this is the Global Health Pursuit. I know you mentioned epilepsy can be cured with surgery. Like, what is the percentage of people that, like, if you were to identify that somebody had a- epilepsy, and this might be going down a rabbit hole, but I'm just, my science brain is just talking right now. Like, how, if not everyone that mm-hmm. lives with epilepsy can be cured by surgery, is that true or? Very true. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people cannot be cured by surgery. A lot of them. That we that need to be put out there, but there's a, I don't know the exact percentage number. I will have to look that up. Mm-hmm. But it's small. It's not as big, and it's something that even when we are working in the countries where we work right now, um, which is on the African continent mainly, where we work, or in South America or Latin America or Asia where we work right now, yeah, uh, we are conscious to to look at what is the main, the biggest need, right? So in some of this part of the world, the biggest need is stigma first. Right, right, right. So you have to destigmatize those who live with the condition overall first. Then when you do destigmatize, now you have to connect them to points of care, you know, where we did create, through that process, led us to create our fair profit company. Mm Mm-hmm. Purple point neurodiagnostics. So you have to bring them to a point of care where they can have diagnostics, they can have follow up, and then their condition can be followed by a neurologist. Because in most places, the WHO has made guidelines for for, for nurses and healthcare providers to take off people with the condition. There's a <clears throat> WHO guideline. These are the questions you ask using those questions and observing clinical, you know, manifestations and whatnot you can actually say, oh, you have epilepsy and it means this is the medication you get. Great. That's a good short-term temporary thing we can do. But I've worked in the United States for years and I've seen that it's done differently. Not that it's done better, it's done differently. Mm -hmm. And our work is trying to bring equal way of taking care of these conditions where I'm from. Right. I, I, I want to I want my cousin Bobby in Banjun to have the same care like my friend John at the you know here in Boston at right. MGH. Why not? So that's our that's our mission. Making sure the same service that is provided here is provided there. And again, it's not easy to do it because again, funding for neurological condition or brain health mm-hmm. Let, let's let's group it to brain health because i think when we say brain health everyone is concerned when we say epilepsy and like oh that doesn't concern me or when you say oh, tumor, yeah. that doesn't concern me but brain health it concerns you it concerns me all of you listening you have a brain and we need to find ways together to look for funding for brain health for us and for others and that's where that's our that's our mission we're trying to make sure that brain health is equitable accessible hmm. brain health is affordable for those who need it the most and you know that's our that's where we are to fight amazing so you were talking about how you're starting this fair profit company 
it wasn't always like this, though, because I I feel like when we first spoke about when we first spoke a few years ago, I think your mission was really to up and like train other neuroscientists and people who can treat these kinds of conditions so that you have more of these physicians in more places around the world that can actually serve patients. Where was the transition? Because I feel like, you know, there's, yeah. there's growth over the years. So I wanted to like kind of connect the dots. Yeah. So growth over the years due to the reality, understanding how the world works, understanding that passion without support leads to burnout. Oh my God. I gotta say that again. Say that again. Passion without support leads to burnout. Mm. And some people usually jokingly say, no money, no mission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's the realization of these two things, that passion without support leads to burnout. And no money, no mission made us rethink our approach to solving this problem. The problem is the same. Access to brain health care. The problem is the same. Empowering people caring for brain around the world. Yeah. Nothing has changed from our core. But we need to evolve in the way of solving it to make it actually sustainable. Because I'll tell you, you know, we have places that I will not name the countries or clinic where we were, we struggled and begged. And I usually, you know, happily use that word because I said, yeah. nonprofit executive for years, yeah. I, I'm a professional beggar and, you know, I kindly really know. <laughs> <laughs> It's so sad. Oh, my gosh. No, I mean, I think we should actually be proud of it. I know people in the nonprofit world don't like this word. But again, we are professional beggars because we, we, yeah. we know what we need to get things done. So, you know, we professionally kindly beg to people who gave a machine. And we also beg for someone who coordinated for the shipping. Right. It, it was an interesting thing where, you know, we just connected people. Someone was shipping a container to a country. Someone had a machine that they donated. Yeah. We got someone who, who does into like, equip, like he works in neurodiagnostics, a very good friend. I guess I'll drop him some advertisement. David Weaver, who has a company that make paste. So when you do the EEG, you use yeah. the paste from mm -hmm. David to, con to make conduct the wires on the brain mm -hmm. he helped us to carry to transport right to transport uh, a donation from one point to another point within the united states so it wasn't a huge but it was a good gesture like he just had one of his trucks pick up an equipment from let's say i think it was from detroit maybe to michigan something like that and then we had someone there who was shipping a container to a country yeah for his own mission trip so we just tack like that and the equipment got to where it was going and it was great. The equipment get there and, you know, the machine is there, the paste, everything is there and, and, and on all. But it carried dust after a while. What do you mean? It, it wasn't being used. It, it wasn't being, they were not really doing anything for it or because, you know, they didn't, really develop a model to make it work, right? So why would the tech do it if they're not getting paid? They love to, to help people, but it, I, mean, I don't think love and passion is going to... It's going to feed it's, yourself. Feed themselves and feed their families, families. right? Mm -hmm. Even though they really, really care about all this patient, how do, you, how do you get them to come to work every day? They're busy going to the farm. Right to do their farming that they will sell when it grows. So those are the things that we may think our passion and mission is to get this there and it would know. So, you know, with Lucian, we thought, and other people and other friends, like, no, it's, 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 not, it's not really providing the care. We need to develop a fair profit model where we make 
a separate company that is for profit, but not to make money, right? Just to be able to collect enough to pay the tech, collect enough to keep the equipment up and running. It's just like a self-churning the- machine in a sense. Exactly. Exactly. But at the time, you know, we didn't know how we could run that with the nonprofit. So we just made that separate. So the nonprofit now stayed with a clear mission of awareness and education. So the nonprofit does one thing. Just focus on awareness, destigmatizing awareness about brain health. That's what it does. That's all it does. It asks for funds, donation to do that. And the nonprofit also supports for the for-profit company in doing the work. For example, if you are in America and you want to pay for the EEG of a of Ludo Aminata in, in Cameroon that mm. we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. you can't really pay the service through the for-profit company, right? But you can write a check, tax deductible check to the nonprofit, nonprofit side, yeah, and say, "Hey, this is my contribution towards your work. I charge you to take care of that kid." Now, in return, the nonprofit will give, make a grant, right, like a caring grant to the for-profit company, like you take care of that of that child. Now the for-profit company on the side knows how, where the money goes, right? Some of it went for the paste. Some of it went for the this. Some of this went for that. Some of it went to pay the technician who provided the test. Mm. Some of it went to pay the neurologist that will follow her up in six months. So that is the mechanism that we develop to make sure that from here, those who care for Aminata and other kids can fit in what they have as support to make sure that that work is going. That is so smart, honestly. With this, the fair profit side, you're developing or you're building clinics in these areas, or are these clinics are already there, it's just partnering with them. Is that how it's working? So, I mean, I would thank Harvard for the education on that. Uh, we, with our fair profit, we were lucky to participate in the Harvard Innovation mm-hmm. Lab. And we were semifinalists and it is a rigorous competitive process yeah. of they select companies or ideas and they really guide students towards refining their value proposition, refining the product, refining the offering. And so it's, it's a whole process of steps that all of us went through at Harvard Innovation Lab to just learn on how to provide the service efficiently, effectively, how to raise funds to make the process go, and how to minimize our risk and cost. So some of it are proprietary to the way we operate, but we operate in a very, very low uh, startup cost in the sense that, you know, but we don't, we don't tend to build a clinic. We don't build a clinic. So just, yeah, yeah we don't yeah. build a clinic. So we reduce that cost of the facility, And we bring the clinic in a different way. Okay. Okay. It's like if you if you were to compare it to something, would it be like a mobile clinic? Yeah, you can call it. Yeah, you can call it like a little mobile (laughs) clinic. I'm like Uh, like trying to spill all your secrets here. No, (laughs) no, I mean we're not afraid to share. We know. I mean, our goal is that you know this again. As I said earlier, and and I hope the WHO comes to me about this. The 80 million Mm. people with epilepsy not the 60 million uh, or 65 million. Uh, those 80 million people, Purple Point and Gohi cannot take care of all of them, right? 100%. We, we, we can't. We can only take care of, ideally our goal in the next five years is to take care of 2 million of them on the continent of Africa. Wow. Like we, that's in five years, we want to take care of 2 million of them. That's, that's the, the market we want to capture yeah. and address. But that's too little to the number of people that need help, right? Because, I mean, I'm being conservative with my numbers because, like, our biggest clinic in Africa, I won't name the country, we see roughly uh, 70 to, the highest is like 70 to 80 patients a month. So Mm -hmm. if you tally that times 10 for one clinic, you know, that's 800 
and you know roughly say a thousand per clinic right so we need like 10 in that country right to, to, to be able to see 10,000 that's 10 clinics right. right so i'm being conscious about how far our company has to go to be able to take care like 2 million or 5 million it's a lot if we see 80 let's even see we see 100 yeah we see a thousand in one side in one country and and we have three focus countries so we also try to be very very conservative so we are in three focus countries we're in cameroon we're in ghana and ghana is our headquarters Mm -hmm. and then we are in a drc congo those are the three countries we want to make sure that brain health in those countries through us is accessible and affordable in the next five years that's our mission you mentioned that you were part of the harvard innovation lab you are pursuing your doctorate at harvard when when you thought about okay i feel like i need to go back to school get my doctorate what what was the reasoning behind that Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if you are, would you do me a tiny favor? Show me some love by doing one or more of these three things. A, click the support this podcast link in the description to donate a few dollars toward the production of this podcast. My dream is to do this full time and your support would mean the world. B, you can write me a review on Apple Podcasts and or rate me on Spotify to give me a boost in the algorithm. Or C, share this episode with someone who would love it just as much as you do. I truly and deeply appreciate you. Let's get back to the episode. I think it was still part of the passion and mission. So the just story to of learn Harvard, more, just to continue yeah. learning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the story of Harvard, I met, you know, through my work in the neurodiagnostic in the United States, I did a lot of work. I serve on the board of the uh, Neurodiagnostic Society of the United States, where you know I was on the board helping draft and craft decisions. And I, I had a very big influence on the international part of it. And we'll go to conferences. So I was in a conference in Las Vegas, and one of my friends who is in the neurodiagnostic, Anna Boner, that is being a mentor, a supporter, a friend. She said, oh, Tigo, that's Dr. William Bozo. That guy is a genius. He used EEG to predict those who would have uh, autism at Harvard. Oh, wow. Children. I'm like, oh, my God. Wow. What, what, like, are these kind of people on earth? Let me say hi to him. Mm. That's how I connected with uh, William Bozel, and we've been friends since then. It was maybe in 2017. Fast forward in 2021, he told me, you need to apply to Harvard. People like you who are bringing these world-class solutions with no resource, you need to go meet other people like you in Boston. You guys in Boston will kill it. You will meet people. You will learn. You will all together just change the world. That's how it it went. It's like, you need to go there, connect with people, learn with them so you guys can change the world. And it was so funny because before I applied to Harvard, I'm like, you know, I want to go see that school. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, I I mean, I know I hear Harvard is all this thing. It's great. It's it's huge. It's big. It's it's all this thing. But I want to go see it. Yeah. The thing that struck me and made me say, you know what? This is true. I need to be here. At Harvard School of Public Health, my school where I go, there's a big sign on the, on the, at the entrance of the school that reads, powerful ideas for a better world. And you see this when you see the School of Public Health, Harvard HSPH or Harvard Chan, as it's called now. You will see that written, powerful ideas for a better world, a healthier world. That, when I saw it, I was like, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I feel it. I think I, this is the place. So that was, you know, one of the things that made me stick around and go there and learn 
and I'm still there finishing soon and I'll move on to do other things. I mean, I did maybe do a little fellowship there yeah. on a few projects I'm working on, but yeah. That is so funny. <laughs> I have to go and see Harvard before. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't think that. It's like, okay, well, like it's an Ivy League school. It's like one of the best schools in the country. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I, I just... You needed I to see to if see it was it. a fit. Yes, yes. Wow. That is that is so funny. But I I mean just so amazing. So November is epilepsy awareness month. And we when we were chatting before this, we were talking about how you wanted to start a campaign to be able to treat more patients living with epilepsy. And you called it you're calling it a coffee for your brain. And <laughs> it's funny because when we were chatting before this, I was like, oh, are we going to talk about like the neurological effects of coffee? But you cleared it up and you're like, well, no, we just want to create more connectiveness, but then also raise more funds. So can you talk about that campaign? Yeah. So coffee for your brain health. So listen again. Coffee for your brain health. One thing I know for sure, and research shows it, that the drinking of coffee mm -hmm. itself is good for your brain health. Like the process of drinking coffee for your brain health. Like the process of sitting at a coffee shop, yep. ordering your coffee, getting that fresh, warm cup of coffee with the flames going up. Like you could see that smoke going up. And the smell of that coffee. Imagine yourself in that moment. And when you take a first sip and you drink, that feeling is coffee for your brain health. That is what we want to connect with. We want you in that moment to give that experience in another way to someone else for his brain health. And it's simple. It's a tab where you go in, you donate a coffee cup for his brain health. And this could be for Aminata, for her to buy her medication for a month. Mm. You could give a bag of coffee for Aminata to have her diagnostics. You could give a container of coffee if you want to take care of a whole village. Yeah. You know, so that in a nutshell is the coffee for your brain health movement and the coffee for your brain health project. And we are hoping to raise funds for brain health in the month of November every year through this Coffee for Your Brain House initiative. And what's the goal this month? I mean, the goal is put awareness out there. We are hoping to reach all your listeners. So I assume you have maybe two, three thousand or <laughs> five thousand or a million. I, I, uh, oh, a million. Oh, my goodness. You're giving me you're giving me too much clout here. <laughs> Not a million, but <laughs> hoping to get there. So roughly, roughly, what is your number? Let's go our goal with that. Yeah. So I would probably say a good like 500. Perfect. So we want to add a zero to that. So we want those 500 people, right, to when they finish drinking their coffee, who listen to your podcast, to send it to 10 of their friends to also those who drink coffee, right? So let's say among these 500, there's 400 that I know for sure drink coffee or tea, yeah. we want those 500, those 400 to drink a cup of coffee and donate a cup of coffee for Epilepsy Awareness Month mm. and send it to 10 of their friends who they know drink coffee or invite them to drink coffee together. And in that moment, you know, give a cup of coffee as a donation for brain health. And the, the reason we're doing this is simply because we need more awareness and the process of doing this will create awareness about brain health, awareness about epilepsy, and also would trigger uh, even the United States government. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know October this month is going to be when funding is going to be decided for next year. Mm -hmm. And even NIH is crying to the government to give more money for epilepsy. And, and this oh, is the wow. thing right here in the United States. And what of countries that usually depend on some 
of the money that the United States get through NIH, and that NIH money trickles down to end up in India, in in Cameroon, in South America. So that's our goal. And we know through coffee that a lot of people drink, we can actually raise money. It could go through Gohi, mm. through us. But, you know, we're hoping that this becomes a movement, right? That a lot of people taking care of brain health, this becomes the vehicle of raising money, particularly for brain health globally. So you heard that. Well, I will throw a link down there, down in the show notes for you to donate, to donate a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or whatever you drink uh, so that we could help Tigo and help treat more patients, you know, with living with epilepsy all around the world. Oh, my goodness. This was so good. And awareness. I mean, some people, some places, they don't even have a technician to do work, but right. just the awareness so that, I mean, Ada can go to school just because her teacher now is talking about epilepsy not being contagious because oh the gosh, teacher huge. was trained. The teacher was trained on epilepsy first aid, understanding about epilepsy. So now the teacher is like, oh, that child is falling. Okay, it's epilepsy. You, 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 take care of that patient. Put the, you know, put a yeah. pillow, take care of it. That destigmatized. Don't run away. Yeah. You're not going to catch epilepsy from looking at yeah. somebody who's having a seizure. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Little things like that. Yeah. I mean, all those little things, it's just kind of, you know, once you have that ripple effect, then it just spreads. And that's really the goal, I think, you know, just first awareness, then treatment. I'm just, yeah. and, wow. and we will be working with the advocate. So, we, you know, at the conference in Kenya, we met a lot of advocates from different countries, Kenya, Zambia, Cameroon, who are epilepsy advocates. People living with epilepsy became advocate. Right. So some of this money raised will go directly to them to support their work because they already have their own nonprofit. They're doing awareness. They're going out there and talking. They don't have access to a lot of funding. Right. We want to be able to also support them to do that work on the ground. I love that. Wow. Okay. So inspiring. Tigo, before we leave... Is there anything else that you'd like my audience to know? Yes, there's one specific thing I want your audience to know, especially your audience who own coffee shops. Mm. So any of your audience who owns a coffee shop, we want them to be like the coffee for your brain village, right? So let's your coffee shop be this year. You can pick a project and be like, you know what? Our coffee shop has a goal to raise thousand dollars for awareness in the united states we want to raise three thousand dollars for awareness in africa or where our coffee comes from we want to raise money for that and right. then we will guide them into making that dream come true wow and i just said a thousand i mean they can say they want to raise a million dollars because as i said five years right we want to take care of Two million people. Right. So to take care of those two million people, even if we say it takes twenty dollars to care for one person, so in five years we need to be able to raise twenty million dollars each year to be able to really achieve these goals. So I don't think we touched on this, but what would be the average cost of taking care of one one person? Yeah, I can give a ballpark. Yeah. So roughly, depending on the country, right, where we work. And EEG is roughly $100, depending on the country. So mm -hmm. 50 to $100, right? So let's go the highest $100 to do the test. Right. And then usually it's about 5 to $10 for medication the whole year. Oh, that's it? That's it. So wow. roughly it's like $150 yeah. to take care of one person with the condition throughout the year, which include the test one time, because you just need to kind of follow up on how things are going and then medication. And, you know, you throw in another maybe $20 there for the neurologist who would follow them up, right? Because they, they have to like, if we need follow up, we need the right. neurologist to talk to them. Yeah. So ballpark 
two hundred dollars to be to exaggerate. Right. Because in major cities you pay a little bit more, but hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars take care of one of these kids the whole year. So someone can say, you know what, I'm gonna take Aminata on me. This is my hundred and fifty bucks. Hey, let Aminata go to school. Wow. That that's really good to put in perspective because I think sometimes people can't wrap their brains around like how much act- it actually costs to help even just one person. So that was good. $150 for a year of testing and treatment. Amazing. Tigo, thank you so much. How how can people get in contact with you? How can people learn more about Gohi and your fair profit company? And how can people get involved? Yeah, I mean, I'll share with you the website. So Gohi, which we're actually redoing the website. A lot of people said the website was not so professional. We're a nonprofit. So if someone wants to be like, hey, I'll pay the $30,000 <laughs> so your website can be good for the whole 10 years. I mean, we had a quote of about $10,000 to redo our website. Yeah. It may sound a lot, but it's just the type of level we are now. So we'll put our website out for Gohi. Uh, the proper point website also will put it out and then social media on both. And soon we'll try to look for volunteers. You could be an advocate, right? You can be a Gohi ambassador in your coffee shop, Gohi ambassador in your university. You could be a Gohi ambassador in your family where we will empower you with messaging on epilepsy awareness and brain health awareness. So those ambassadors, we actually would, kind of help you set up your Facebook or social media to automatically post messages about awareness. So mm. we have, don't have to do much. We can just have your access to, you know, just the name of your social media, and then we can have you share the message. Wow. All of those links, if you want to go find those, will be in the show notes of this episode. Tigo, thank you so much for this such like it was such an insightful conversation i've i feel like i always learn so much so thank you thank you for coming on the podcast thank you for listening to this episode if you'd like to learn more about today's topic and guest head over to the show notes linked in the description of this episode There, you can get access to resources, links, and ways you can get involved in the pursuit for global health. And if you loved this episode, don't forget to write me a review on Apple Podcasts and rate the podcast on Spotify. It helps me get in front of more people just like you and continues to elevate the causes we are so passionate about. I'll see you in the next one.